Good evening, everyone. Today is uh, August 31st, and it is 6 p.m., and we'll call this meeting to order. Welcome to the Northern Region Regional Advisory Committee meeting, or council meeting. Um, this meeting is being held in person at the Weber County Commission Chambers in Ogden, Utah, as well as being streamed live on YouTube. Uh, this is a public forum allowing you to express your opinions and proposals on the management of wildlife in our state. This RAC considers your ideas, opinions, and proposals and reports them to the Wildlife Board. The Wildlife Board, not the RAC, is charged with setting wildlife policy for our state. Um, we all come to this meeting with a lot of thoughts and, and a lot of uh, emotion and, and passion towards wildlife. And we just ask that as you're here, that as you share your thoughts or your comments, that you please do so respectful to everyone, even when you may not agree with what someone has to say. Um, We'll just ask that no rude comments or any type of derogatory statements towards anyone be taking place. If they do, we, we will ask people to we'll ask people to leave. Um, I want to start by welcoming the RAC members. Um, I'll have each of them introduce themselves. I'll start as Justin Oliver. I am the RAC chair, and I represent the public at large. And we'll start with Brad. Brad Buchanan, sportsman. Matt Clark, Ogden at large. Kevin McLeod at large. Randy Hutchison at large. Paul Chase, Forest Service. Nikki Wayment, non consumptive. Jamie. Hi, Jamie Butler, non consumptive users. All right, so Jamie will be our only member that will be joining us virtually. Jamie, throughout the meeting, if I forget anything, don't be afraid to yell out or something to get my attention, okay? Good, um, thank you. Thank you for having this option for these times when it's hard to get there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, we also have Ryan Brown, who is in uh, transit to be here, and so he will be here shortly. Those who are being excused are Junior Goring, David Earl, Casey Snyder, Mike Lauder, Dave, Darren Perry, Emily Jensko, and Ryan Brown. We still have a quorum, just barely, but we do have a quorum, and so... Um, and as, as Ryan gets here, we'll make sure that uh, he, he introduces himself. Um, we also wanna welcome the DWR staff that is here. Um, Randy Opplinger, the sports fish coordinator, um, Guy Wallace, the Southeast wildlife manager, um, and Chad Wilson, the public wildlife and private lands coordinator, as well as our local um, divisional employees who are here today. Um, and then we also wanna welcome the public that are attending in person and those who are watching online. Those that are attending here in person will have the opportunity to, to ask questions at the appropriate time to the division. You will also are welcome to comment. If you're going to have a comment, we ask that you fill out the comment cards that are in the back. And then if you'll bring them forward to, to Jody, she will get them to us. Um, those people who are watching online won't have the opportunity to share their thoughts or questions, but they have, you know, we have had the opportunity to do so by the public forum that uh, is on the division webpage. So people have had the opportunity to give us their feedback. Um, so with that, we'd like to, to begin the meeting by having a, uh, hopefully everyone's had the opportunity to look at both the minutes and the agenda for today. Is there any questions or anything about the, past minutes of our last meeting or the agenda for today. And if they're not, I'd entertain a, a motion to do both at the same time, both approve the minutes and the agenda. I'll make that motion. So we have a motion by Matt Clark. I'll second it. And a second by Randy Hutchinson. Um, how should we do this both? So there's just a few of us here. Should we call it out? We'll do a we'll roll call. We'll start with uh, with Jamie. We'll start with Brad. <laughs> yes. 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 Jamie, were you able to hear that? Yes, sorry, I lost you for a minute. Okay. Oh, yes, I do. Yeah. All right. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, we will now make sure I follow the procedure, right? We'll now give a minute to our uh, 
to Ben Nadowski, who is going to give us an update from last uh, week's wildlife board meeting. Thank you. Good to have you back, Jamie. Looks like you've been pushing some buttons yourself. Um, <clears throat> okay, you'll remember last time we were here when we had the audio visual challenges from all the button pushing behind the podium. Uh, we were here to discuss the land use rule as well as our proposed fee schedule. So for the land use rule, um, there was a motion made that, to ask the division to look into guides and outfitters uh, that they obtain special use permits on WMAs and to look at implementing a fee for non-consumptive users um, and that, that that was to be placed on the action log that I am passed unanimously. Um, and then there was a motion made to approve the balance of the recommendations that also passed unanimously. For the proposed fee schedule, um, there was quite a bit of discussion um, on non-resident, um, uh, on this motion that came up was, I move that we raise the non-resident 18 to 64 hunting license to $120 and non-resident combination license to 150 and leave the non-resident youth licenses as proposed. Uh, that I am passed unanimously. Uh, there was also a lot of discussion about the spot and stock cougar permits, um, primarily around the price of those permits and uh, ways that the division can make people more uh, aware that they exist. And at the end, there was a motion to adjust the spot and stock cougar permit price to $10 and make it an option during the license checkout process and that passed unanimous. Still in the proposed fee schedule, there was a motion to set the buyout amount for dedicated hunter program at $25 for the first 16 hours, and then 40 for the remaining 16. That passed unanimously. Um, motion to approve the remainder as presented with the modifications already indicated before with the um, spot and stop proposal and that passed unanimously. They also discussed the expo, expo audit, which we did not um, hear here in the, in the uh, rack uh, process that was um, accepted as presented and that passed unanimously, uh, followed by expo, expo permit allocation. Um, motion was made to accept the allocation as presented and that passed unanimous. And just so folks are aware, we've got um, some folks here in the audience that can answer any questions if any come up, but every August, especially during these drought years, we've committed that we'll come back to the board um, if there are emergency big game um, drought recommendations that need to be made. Um, that was indeed the case this year for the Henry Mountains. So there was a recommendation to um, increase permits for bison on the Henry Mountain. Uh, that uh, proposal or that motion passed unanimously. And finally, there was a little bit of housekeeping, but as most of you probably know by now, Joel Ferry, um, formerly of the well, who serves on the in the legislature was appointed by the governor to uh, be the executive director of DNR. Uh, Joel also <coughs> served on our CWMU advisory committee. So um, a little bit of housekeeping, we needed to replace him. There's in code, there's a requirement for an elected official on that committee. So um, we recommended Randy Elliott. He's a commissioner for Davis County and a uh, motion was made to replace Joel with Randy and that passed unanimously. That's it for the summary, Chair. Thank you, Ben. Before we go to the next, is there anyone, did anyone have any questions about what took place in the, or comments about the wildlife board and those proposals? I, I really liked the thought of the, that the mountain lion tag or the cougar tag to be available, you know, for someone to have it in their pocket in case that opportunity came. And I also like the idea that it's the, the board push to try to have it come as an option in the cart when you purchase your, uh, your license because that will make it a little bit easier to do it right at that time instead of trying to remember or relog back in. So I thought that was a, a great idea, just my opinion. Um, ben, we're going to turn it back over to you one more time now to do your regional, the Northern Regional update. Okay, thank you. Mike, Phil, just advance a quick slide. Um, so I just want to give you guys an update on some of the activities that have been taking place in the region since we last met, it hasn't been too long, but uh, our staff have been really busy. Our law enforcement section has been um, seeing uh, reports that hunters are seeing a lot of game out there, but there a lot of folks are not um, choosing to take. They're kind of putting it off and maybe looking for what they want. So we have not had too many cases yet, <coughs> if any. Is that right, Dave? Um, seems to be that compliance has been pretty well. I know that was the report in the Central Region last night too, so. Hopefully that remains the case here. 
Um, we are uh, sending three recruits to the police academy um, that we'll be bringing into the into the region, uh, trying to get our ranks full, but our Davis and Weber district will, re will remain vacant for now. Um, our, I really do need to commend and, and thank our law enforcement officers for all the work they're doing on our WMAs. Um, we've talked a lot in this group about the pressures on our WMAs um, outside of just wildlife and wildlife uses. And we have had a really hard time um, gaining or maintaining control of our WMAs at times from those uses. And um, we've had some officers that have committed just a really a ton of time and effort to make sure that the uses of the WMA are consistent with the rules and laws of those WMAs. So hats off to them, especially ahead of the hunt so that hunters can have access to those WMAs for what they're intended for. Um, our law enforcement officers are kind of a funny bunch. They're, they're pretty modest, I'd say. They're, they're not super good at taking pictures while they're out doing work. And so my lieutenant just posted the same picture that we keep showing of Simon Creek. But uh, <laughs> there are a few exceptions. There are some cops out there that do get take good photos and some of them are featured in the UCOA magazine. That's the Utah Conservation Officers Association magazine. Lieutenant Beverage has got a whole stack of them back there. There's some really great um, stories in there. Um, gives you some insight into some of our staff and uh, get to know them on a more personal level, but also get to know some of the work that they do in the field. And I've got a daughter that wants to be a game warden one day and she always loves it when I bring one of those home. So um, I think you guys will enjoy it. Next slide. Um, our habitat section has been doing a lot of work with beavers. Um, Ryan Brown's gonna be late. Funny thing is he's actually out in the field working with some of our researchers on beaver um, trapping and relocation. So that's actually what's causing him to be late, I understand. So, um, but we use beaver to address conflicts and restore habitat. We're doing it right now in the, in the Chalk Creek watershed. Um, beavers can be problematic critters, there's no doubt about it. I've been on the wrong end of beavers in the wrong place before and it has caused a lot of trouble for me and I, can relate with those landowners that are that are struggling with the conflicts. Um, so we go out, we trap beavers from those conflict areas, and then we put them in areas where there is uh, little or no conflict, and where landowners are are wanting them, and they just make a huge difference. Uh, so we recently did. You can see in this picture on the top left, there's a um, reporter and a photographer. Um, a, one of these cases that we did, and one of the releases we did, and just outside of Colville and Chalk Creek was featured on CBS Morning Show. It's actually a pretty good piece they did. So um, anyway, a bunch of really good work from volunteers, uh, researchers, DWR, uh, that deserve highlighting. Next slide, Mike. Um, it, you know, speaking of volunteers, there's really, it's really impressive how much you can get done when you've got friends. And um, the last time we were in this meeting, I reported on a guzzler that was built in the Newfoundland Mountains for bighorn sheep. And at that time, we had more material and we flew the material in for an additional guzzler, but they didn't have the time and the manpower on site to build that guzzler. And so this um, group of volunteers from the Wild Sheep Foundation went out last week and built an entire guzzler without, without the need for the division to do it. Um, they're just incredible partners. The, if anybody's ever been in the Newfies, super rugged and remote terrain. I mean, it's just hard work putting up a guzzler like that and pounding those stakes, um, pounding those posts into that kind of country is really, really hard work. But these guys are absolutely passionate, motivated about the work. And they went out and did work that the division wanted to done, done needed to be done so that Utah's um, hunters could have these opportunities and these resources. And so we really appreciate the work that they did. Um, it just, goes to show the value of partnerships. Mike? Yes. Of course, you probably have heard about the Cinnamon Creek WMA. We had a ribbon cutting on August 5th. It was something in our last meeting I was updating you guys on. This picture is kind of funny because none of these guys look nearly as wet as they actually are. Um, <laughs> it was a beautiful day. Everything was going great. The food was great. The company was great. The WMA looks beyond great. Um, everybody was really flying high. And then as soon as the ceremony started, I'm telling you, it's, it rained and it only seemed to rain over the parking lot at that moment. Like, <laughs> but it was a, a indication of, of more rain to come. And uh, we powered through the ceremony. Everything was fine. People's spirits remained high. 
but um, that did seem to be the start of a new cycle of monsoons. Next slide. At the time of that ribbon cutting, we did have some recreational shooting closures in place that were temporary at some of our WMAs. Um, we were coming into that time just thinking, man, uh, fire risk is absolutely through the roof. We had extreme, quote, extreme designations by the state um, and federal partners in, in our entire region. And so we do have the ability within code to enact temporary um, recreational target shooting closures when the conditions are extreme. So for a short period, we did have 12 WMAs in five counties in the Northern region where we had shooting closures in place, but we were able to quickly rescind them with the monsoons and, and improved conditions that came. And so it was a temporary closure, but uh, we're glad that we made it through without any fires like the one you see here from a few years ago at Hennifer Echo. Next. Um, doesn't mean that everything is perfect. There are some challenges in aquatics. You guys have heard a little bit about how our section is dealing with uh, reduced water supply around the state. Um, as part of tonight's proposals, we've got kind of a programmatic approach to having a new normal of less water. But uh, I won't bore you with more of that unless you've got questions, we've got the experts in the room. But our aquatic section is doing some aerial stocking of the high Uinas. Um, those are high elevation, probably high thrill um, events where they come in with an airplane and drop fish out of the belly of the plane. There's some really cool footage online of us doing that. Actually, last time we put a video out, I think it went traveled around the world. Really cool work. Um, we do have a crew that's going out and doing cutthroat trout electrofishing surveys. That's been ongoing throughout the summer and they've got some left still. We did do a gillnet survey at Bear Lake recently. Um, we're stocking channel catfish and community fisheries still with the warm temperatures. So in the spring, we stock rainbow trout, transition over to catfish, and then we can do more rainbow trout when it cools down in the fall. And our native fish crew is doing at least chub transfer as well. Next slide. Um, in our wildlife <coughs> section, we're wrapping up preseason elk and pronghorn classification. Um, we are continuing to do big game depredation counts. Uh, we are in the rotation this year to do an update to all of our unit deer plans. So that is actually um, taking place currently. I think the drafts are ready for Salt Lake Review, but you guys will be seeing them in, in short order. Uh, rabbit surveys are continuing on and we're training up. So that's good news. And we're preparing and releasing birds for the youth chucker um, hunt on the 17th and preparing for the waterfowl hunt. And a uh, big effort that's coming up in sometime in the middle of October right now, it's slated for the 15th, but there's a lot of logistics. So I wouldn't be too surprised if that date changes, but we've got a team that'll be heading to um, Arizona to pick up some big horn sheep to release on Antelope Island. So keep your fingers crossed there. Next slide. Um, this is something that uh, everybody's hearing about the avian flu. Um, we had seen an, uh, a slowdown in the occurrence of avian flu during July and August. Uh, the last update I got anyway was 44 birds and two foxes across nine counties statewide that tested positive. Um, we do keep a dashboard with live information. This is just a screenshot of what our dashboard looks like. Um, but we're starting to see recent increases due to fall migration taking place, um, particularly in Canada geese. So that's starting to tick up again. Um, I know Randy has asked for if there's any updates on uh, guidance or advice for hunters, especially related to um, bird dogs. So our uh, our vet is preparing that advice currently. So I'll look for it shortly. Sure to point it out to you for sure when I when I see it. Next slide, Mike. Um, I couldn't remember if I reported on this to you guys last year last meeting or not. So I thought I'd re-report here, but. Um, our natives crew has been doing a ton of work on the bluehead soccer population on the Weaver River. We recently hosted a tour, and there was a uh, there's a pro there's a project on the Weaver in Ogden City that was awarded the statewide outdoor recreation project of the year, and it was a partnership between Ogden City engineers and our DWR biologists, where they built a kayak park that was built in a way with the hydraulics necessary to pass for passage, including adults and juveniles. And so it was a cool cool um, partnership that came together and it was nice to see them be recognized for that work. 
Um, they completed the emergency transfer of least chub from Pilot Pond and identified new populations of winged floaters, mussels in Ogden Bay and Salt Creek WMAs. And they're working with a private landowner out in Box Elder County on the Raft Rivers to uh, improve a diversion on the South Fork of Junction Creek that will uh, pass fish, but also screen the diversion so fish aren't going down the diversion and staying in the system. I think there's Yellowstone cutthroat in this particular system. So we're keen on keeping them in place. Of course, the Great Salt Lake is not to be forgotten. Um, international headlines will make sure that we're not forgetting it. That's for sure. We're getting a ton of media and for good reason. We continue to hit record lows. Some of this recent rain has really been helpful um, for microbial lights, my understanding. But um, we did have our boat craned out of the marina along with everyone else's. The water levels just got so low and so fast that boats were having a hard time getting out of the marina to get out of the water. So we were able to take advantage of a crane service to get our boat out. Um, thank you to the brine shrimpers who allowed us to relaunch our boat. We had a long period there where we couldn't go out on the lake and sample brine shrimp. And so it was becoming pretty worrisome when we have international attention on a resource that we manage um, due to low water, but that same low water kept us from getting out on the lake to monitor the resource. So we were getting pretty nervous, but we do know that salinity is extremely high, greater than 18%. And I've been sitting in some meetings with some really, really smart people, including Jamie, um, who's on our rack with us. She works in this world and they've got a ton of high level science and some really um, amazing uh, models that help to for and strip condition. Uh, and this salinity is becoming a serious concern. It's getting to a point where it's getting so high, we really don't have data that can predict what's gonna happen. We just know we're kind of at that point that um, everybody's worried about it. So in spite of that, the brine shrimp numbers do look good. Um, the season will open up here shortly on the 1st of October and uh, the numbers look good for harvest, but the navigation for brine shrimp harvesters is going to be a challenge. So uh, a lot of shallow water out there. Those are big vessels that need to get out um, to harvest brine shrimp. So probably going to be a fair bit of shoreline harvest um, this upcoming season. Um, but luckily the numbers look good. I did report last time on a region wide or a flyway wide shorebird survey. Uh, that was completed and it took over 100 volunteers to get that done. So an awesome effort. Again, can't overstate the value of volunteers. Um, but our team was also recently asked to provide an airboat tour for a number of local leaders. There's a picture I grabbed from the standard examiner. I think it's Senator Romney, Speaker of the House Wilson, and our new DNR, DNR Director Joel Ferry on the front, driven by Chad Cranny. Um, all eyes are on the lake right now, that's for sure. Next. Our waterfowl crew, including Chad Cranny, was there uh, driving that airboat. He had left this uh, Fragmites project that he does, that he leads for uh, pretty much all of the Great Salt Lake and, and the waterfowl areas statewide. He leads a huge effort. So we did have a successful Fragmites burn at Ogden Bay and Salt Creek. Um, we were able to plant food plots and shrubs at Farmington Bay, Ogden Bay, and Salt Creek. And what they call the annual Fragmites project is the uh, spraying of, of frag from August 8th to September 9th. So it's just wrapping up. Um, if you need to talk to the waterfowl guys, you know where to find them. They're in the frag. Uh, next slide. Um, our outreach section did a really neat thing with the beginners big game hunting clinic. Um, this is something that they did in partnership with the Utah backcountry hunters and anglers. It was uh, an idea they brought to us. We liked the idea. And they came together and proposed five nights of instruction on hunting instruction, ethics, did a field day and a range day and went through field dressing. It was really well received and attended. And it's probably something we're looking to do again in the future and maybe even upsize it so we can provide that service to more people. Next slide. They also hosted a pointing dog clinic. Um, this is a free training that was provided by Brent Wanacott. Anybody that knows him knows he knows what he's doing. We had 32 hunters and their pointers that participated. Again, this is something that we got really good feedback from and 
there's probably more demand to do more of this kind of um, education. Uh, next. Um, sales and administration, we've got a whole team that we, I don't usually report on here, but they keep our business, kind of our, um, they keep our doors open and our business operating throughout the day. Uh, our opening sales day for um, elk tags are here. There's a picture from, this is a picture taken, I think it was in 1983. Yeah. <laughs> if you look closely, you can see there's just, looks like there's hunters, maybe three or four abreast going all the way around the entire parking lot. But it, outside of this picture, they would go all the way around the building and into what is now um, neighboring businesses. Uh, I'll dis, I'll discount the mullet joke <laughs> and, and just continue on. But uh, I, I think that there's a lot of fear that that's what people are going to encounter when they go to buy over the counter elk permits this year. It's not the case anymore. We do still see a little bit of panic and people coming to the regional office on the, the first day, but um, this year was a lot better. We had our systems in place. Our Salt Lake staff just did a ton of work to get our, all of our software um, ready for that high demand. And it seemed to go a lot smoother this year. So we didn't see that kind of demand and backup like we would like we had seen for the last couple of years. But uh, so hopefully you guys are hearing better feedback from this year. Uh, that's certainly what, what we're hearing. I think that, oh, and I always like to finish off with rack member opportunities. So if any of you guys wanna get out with our staff, I know when I go out with my staff, I'm incredibly humbled and impressed. Um, so if you guys wanna be humbled and impressed, I'd, I'd encourage you to go. Um, elk and pronghorn classifications, you can still do some of that. Um, we've got, cutthroat trout surveys, including at Cinnamon Creek coming up. Uh, we do a gill net survey every fall at Willard Bay. That'll be coming. Those are long days, lots of fish, a lot of spines and razor sharp um, things in your hands, but it is a lot of fun. <laughs> I do try to make these opportunities sound amazing, right? <laughs> but it's fun. You see a ton of fish and you actually get a really good sense for what is in Willard Bay. And of course, you'd be alongside um, some of the smartest fisheries managers around. So, um, and then of course, beaver translocation is, is gonna continue on. That's where Ryan Brown is at. He was able to join us for, for one last week, I think that one in Chalk Creek. So um, yeah, those are some opportunities that are coming up. If anybody's interested, just let me know and I'd be happy to help facilitate. I'm sure there's other stuff going on too. So if you hear of anything else that you're interested in, just let me know. I think that's it, that's it. Okay. Any questions? Okay. You did good. Thanks. Does anyone know what the back in the day when the Great Salt Lake was at its highest? What was that? Salinity? What was the word to use? Oh, salinity. Salinity. What was the highest that it? That Jamie. Was at? Anyone know? You know, um, I don't know the lowest salt content that we've ever gotten to. And luckily, brine shrimp and the microbialites have like, and those are like the two keystone species that the entire ecosystem relies on. So luckily, they have a really wide um, tolerance for salt content or salinity is what Ben said. I would just um, add a comment that um, researchers think that in the next two years, if nothing changes, that our brine shrimp population populations are going to crash. And what that means is an almost an entire world's population of eared grebes that won't have hardly anything to eat. So these are like really dire headlines that um, kind of have, I think, the Great Salt Lake community kind of um, flabbergasted, really. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, there any other questions for Ben or any comments? We'll go ahead and move to our, our first to Kevin. I think it was 1983, 82 or 83. The salinity of the lake was low enough that the water froze along the uh, Antelope Causeway and uh, they they couldn't get the boats across. They had to, had to drive across or whatever. So. The salinity has been down low enough. Uh, we just want, we don't want red mud to, to come down Red Canyon again, but we need some water. 
All right, if there's no other questions or comments, we'll go to our uh, first action item on our agenda item number five, which is the 2023 fishing recommendation and rule. Um, we have here Randy Opplinger, the sport fish coordinator. Just for those, just as a reminder that um, we will not be having a presentation here. Everyone should have had the opportunity to watch that presentation and be familiar with it. So what our process will go as followed. We will um, open up for questions from members of the RAC for Randy at this time. After the RAC questions, we'll then give an opportunity if there's anyone in the audience would like to ask a question. Following that question period, we will then hear from our, we will then hear from our surveys, from our, uh, that the, what do you wanna call those electronic surveys that were sent out if there's, any, after we hear from them, we will then open up for comments from the public and then comment, then comments from the, the rack. So with that, um, we'll ask if Randy would please come forward. And at this time, if there's any, if there's anything first, Randy, if there's anything that you would like to share that might add to the meeting, please do. And also this would be the time for any questions that anyone has for him. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. We haven't changed our proposals or anything based on what we presented earlier. So what you saw in the presentation is what we're currently proposing. What would you say is the, I, I don't know if I want to add it, just if there's, what would be the largest or the biggest change that that you've proposed that maybe we'd? I think the biggest change we're proposing is the round tail chub regulation change. So this would be the reclassification of round tail chub as a sport fish species. So currently it's prohibited. Um, We've been evaluating populations around tail chub. That's a species of, it's technically a species of greatest conservation need here in the state, but its numbers are fairly robust here in Utah. Uh, it is a species that other states have allowed for sport fishing, and it's been a very popular opportunity. They're a fun species to catch. So we're proposing that, that reclassification of them as a sport fish species. And then in my presentation, I laid out three kind of regulation scenarios that would apply across the state to our various uh, round tail chub populations. Thank you. Does anyone have any, is there any questions from the RAC considering about this? All right, do we have any questions from memory, members of the public? All right. I, I actually have some questions. Okay, go ahead, Jamie. So, okay, so first of all, in the fishing regulations, in one of them, it talked about a bonus limit and why, like, what's the difference between, like, a bonus limit and just, like, upping the number of, of permits? Like, on some of them, um, on some of them, it went from, like, four to eight fish. What's that bonus limit? What the bonus limit does is it allows us to apply a special regulation that is specific to a species of fish that we would like to see harvested, perhaps, in greater numbers. So, the case you're bringing up is state line reservoir where we're proposing a regulation of basically continuing the four trout regulation that's on that water. But what we wanted to do was provide a bonus limit of four additional kokanee salmon. With that's this case, it's a water where we want to see additional kokanee harvest. What this does is allows people to take up to eight fish if they are targeting kokanee salmon. So it allows additional take of kokanee salmon to help thin the population. And so why didn't you just up the limit? Uh, because in that case, if we up the limit, that would allow additional harvest of other trout species that are in the reservoir and they might not be species that we're not uh, maybe asking anglers to target or look for increased harvest on. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, and in regards to the round tail chub, um, I know like taking it off of this like list of uh, concern, like how have threats to the round tail chub been eliminated? Like why have, have, have they increased? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I think the main reasons that we've seen them increase is we've done uh, some habitat improvement work, uh, additional monitoring of populations. I don't know if their populations were necessarily in that bad of shape. They were never listed as an endangered species or a threatened species. But I think what we've seen over time is we've seen uh, through our monitoring efforts, uh, uh, certainly a stable population, a consistent population, and a population that we think is 
at a level that could sustain some fishing pressure to it. So I think what we've seen here over time is some initial concerns about low numbers, but then through additional harvest, or not, not harvest, sorry, but additional monitoring, we've, uh, you know, kind of gotten a, a better grasp on what the population looks like, and we have a better hold of uh, whether that population can take some fishing pressure or not. We feel that it can based on our data. And and do you have like like measurable criteria that you use in that, or is this like an initial? I don't know. How how do you measure that? Yeah, we don't have measurable criteria per se. I think we're able to, in some ways, compare uh, against other populations. It's a little bit of an apples to oranges comparison, though. So they, you know, we're looking at different populations, different species, different systems. What our plan in this case is, you know, we're we're, we're putting some regulations in place that we feel are fairly conservative regulations that we're, uh, we feel that the populations can sustain. But uh, what we're also gonna couple this with is a pretty intensive monitoring. So we'll be evaluating this, see what the trends are within the round tail child populations after we initiate these regulation changes. And that may prompt some additional regulation changes over time, depending on uh, what we see the populations do after we put these regulations in place if they're approved by the Racks and Wildlife Board. And would that, would like one of the goals be a measurable criteria that you could kind of go on? I think over time, what we'll be able to do is flush out a measurable goal, you know, a targeted, you know, for instance, catch per unit effort, because we're often electrofishing for these fish. That's the way we measure numbers of fish is basically the number of fish we catch per hour electrofishing. I think once we're able to see kind of the, the, the effect of uh, regulations on the species, we'll be able to initiate some, you know, actual measurable criteria for the species. And um, I assume this takes more staff. Do, is there enough staff at the Division of Wildlife to do that additional like monitoring? Yeah, I feel like we have dedicated staff, not for round-tailed chub per se, but native species throughout the state, particularly in the Colorado River and tributaries of the Colorado River, which are where the round-tailed chub is native. And uh, we feel we have a sufficient staffing there to, to really continue the monitoring efforts that we've traditionally done for the species, which is, should be adequate effort. Cool. And I just have a comment, um, and it was kind of for the whole um, kind of fisheries rule and thinking about fisheries. A lot of what I read was talking about catch and release and using like proper methodology for catching and releasing. Um, I have seen, I, I would encourage the Division of Wildlife to look at some of your commercials because they don't have like that proper, like keep them in the water. They're like holding them out of the water. Um, some of them that I've seen, um, I thought, I, and I'm not a fisher person, I'm not an angler. So I guess I would just make that comment of, I would encourage you to look at the outreach that's happening with catch and release. Yeah, thank you for that comment. We'll definitely, I'll, I'll bring that to our outreach section and um, maybe have them look at it a little bit more how we're presenting that. Awesome. Thank you for your time. I so much appreciate you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, this time we were, I was just, we're going to turn some time over to Ben, our regional supervisor, to summarize the public comments received on this agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We only received one comment. Um, the comment was... Uh, in strong support, strongly agreed with the division's proposal. Uh, since there's only one comment, I'll just read the comment that was written. I'm providing this input on behalf of the Utah Anglers Coalition. Um, the UAC is an affiliation of many different angler groups and fishing industry representatives in the state of Utah. As a group, we support the proposed changes to the 2023 Utah Fishing Guidebook as contained in the presentation by Randy Oppinger. We also support recommended changes to Rule 657-13 and 14. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have one comment card from the public. If there's anyone else that would like to, I'd ask you to bring it forward at this time, but we'll ask Kevin to come forward. Kevin Norman, representing Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. Why would you say, Randy, it's good to have you back. It's good to see you. You're kicking butt. Good job, brother. Um, <clears throat> Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife supports the division's recommendations, and uh, that's it on this. Thanks. All right, thank you. Do we have, uh, is there any comments or discussion from the RAC concerning this agenda item? Just a quick comment, it was just an observation. I, I'm not a huge angler, I, I dabble a little bit. Um, and I laughed a little bit when there's only one feedback form that came. I, it's, 
I was shocked by that, but that's always the case. But I take that as a, actually as a compliment for you guys. There's more, if memory serves, there's far more fishing licenses sold than anything else in the state. And people would be yelling and screaming if they're very unhappy about something. So to me, that means that you're doing, doing good work. So we just appreciate it very much. Can I make a quick comment about that? Yes. You know, I, it's not always really my place to say, it, but I just wanted to support your comment because the the one comment we did receive, which was from an, a, a group of angling groups, um, having that group in support shows that there are a lot of groups that are in the angling community that are that support the work that that our fisheries biologists are doing, but they're not supporting it blindly. They're supporting it because they're really engaged with our staff, and our staff are really engaged back. We have a really good working relationship with the um, angling community. And so I do think your observation is right. It's, you're not seeing a lot of input because the input has been gained long ahead, long before the recommendations were made. And the support is there because um, we've got just a really engaged angling community that that is there along the way and in the boat with our fisheries biologists as they're collecting information at Willard Bay and so on. So I just wanted to mention that because we do a lot of that in this work. Um, across the agency. And um, I think our fisheries folks just deserve a lot of praise for the work they're doing with, with constituents. I almost got tired of listening to Randy on the presentation. Uh, it was, and, and I say that uh, kind of jokingly, but what a great presentation. Uh, very comprehensive. The work that was done to think that there was 25,000 plus emails sent out and surveys and and uh, they didn't take this lightly and they they did a lot of really good work and uh, and I for one as a citizen appreciate that. I also agree the proactive uh, approach that you're taking on with considering the the drought that we're in and the, the effects that it have on our on the on the fish and the, the different species in our in our state and to to be proactive and trying to get ahead of that and not reactive I think also is why we're not hearing too many comments you're you're doing a good job so thank you and if we have any more comments if not I'd also entertain a, a motion at this time uh, I'll make the motion to accept the recommendation as proposed so a motion by Randy to accept as proposed. I'll second. And a second by Brad Buchanan. Any discussion on the motion? All right, I'll call for a vote. Jamie, start if we start with you. I agree. Yes. Brad? Yes. Matt? Yes. Randy? Yes. Yes. Paul and yes. Nikki. All right. Are we good without, we were hoping Randy, do I, are Ryan's here? I don't need to vote on this, right? We have a quorum. We're good to go. All right. Okay. So most motion, excuse me, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. We'll now move forward to our next agenda item. Agenda item number six, uh, the Henry Mountains Bison Management Plan. We have Guy Wallace, wildlife manager down there. We'll have him come forward this time uh, and guys is there anything that uh, you would like to add to your that to, that wasn't mentioned in the presentation that may help us um, yeah first of all I'm glad to be here uh, to talk about the the bison plan and the meetings really about the plan itself but in the presentation and uh, and last night at the rack meeting I talked a little bit more about the committee process and what we went through we had a, a very diverse committee uh, and we had some hard candid discussions about issues that were of concern to the members of the committee. And Ben was, uh, had the privilege of facilitating that committee. And, uh, and so I've asked Ben if he would be willing to make some comments on his thoughts uh, on the process and the, how the committee functioned. And I'd appreciate no comments about the committee chairman. <laughs> yeah, in case you're wondering, Guy is the committee chairman. And I don't know if I'd go as far as say it was a privileged guy. 
Um, yeah. No, I mean, it was a privilege, but in, in all candor, I was nervous when asked to do it. Um, anybody that's been involved in big game management knows that the Henry Mountains and Bison pretty much in Utah um, are full of conflict. And so that conflict is why that committee is needed and no plan is good without a process that that is better right and so we come here a lot we talk about committees we talk about the recommendations of committees um, but it helps to know and having served on one and helping to facilitate um, this one um, a lot of work does go into it and a lot of training goes into it for the staff that are involved. Um, so they they asked me to, uh, at the time it was Director Fox when we started, we took a long COVID break, didn't we? Um, but it's also been a really hard plan and you get you make really incremental uh, progress every single meeting. And there's a lot of sometimes tension in those decisions. And it was my job as facilitator to make sure that it didn't rise to the level of contention and it was Guy's job to make sure that we achieved the, you know, the the agenda for the night. But um, sometimes you achieve some level of tension without boiling over into contention by making sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak. And that's the facilitator's role to make sure that everybody has a chance to weigh in, to give input when something is said and it's not addressed. It's the facilitator's role to step in and make sure it's said. So. I just I share that because the division takes that role really seriously. Um, I know I did as a facilitator. I know that every facilitator does for every committee because it's more than just we don't just appoint a committee that's going to give us the answers we want. We appoint a committee that's going to give us the information we need so that we can collectively make a decision that, that Utah needs. Um, and in this case, there's a lot of different stakeholders that needed to have a voice at the table. And it was really important that we gave them that voice. And honestly, there were times where um, push would come to shove and it would just get really, really uncomfortable, but we always shoved our way through it. And we came out of it, you know, shaking hands at the end of the meeting, even sometimes giving hugs. And um, I don't know, it's just been one of those experiences in my professional career. Um, it was actually a privileged guy to, to work alongside you and Wade and um, to get to spend time with the regional staff, but also get to work with and spend time with your local constituents that um, have a vested interest in the resource and in the landscape. They, they're not just making noise because they want to make noise. They're making noise because they've got, you know, things that are impacting them and impacting their lives. So um, the plan that's coming forward, I, I know it's um, maybe if every individual is looking at it, you might think it's imperfect, but if everybody is a committee and as a set of stakeholders looks at it, um, I hope it's as close to perfection as we can get. Uh, it, the process was painstakingly difficult, but absolutely worth every step of the way. So I'm glad we're finally at this point. It was just a long time coming and uh, couldn't have been done without some real hard work by a lot of folks. And and two, it, you know, Ben did a great job of keeping us on track and keeping us going, make sure that we completed or got through the agendas and and uh, everybody had an opportunity to voice their concerns and so i think as far as that part of the process i think we accomplished that that everybody had an opportunity to to be heard and uh, so i just felt that was an important part of the of this plan um and we can i can answer any questions i have wade paskett here who's the biologist for the henry mountains uh, so if we have specific questions, we'll be happy to answer best we can. Okay, hopefully everyone had a chance to, to watch the presentation and also to look over the notes. It's the, the entire bison management plan. It, there was a lot to it. And I'd say if there's any questions on any of the particular items, this, this would be your time to ask them. It looks like Randy has a question. So I want, just want to start out. I'd love that you're doing this. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I think that hurts a national treasure. I mean, it's just it's great, and I and I love it that we have it here, and and just some information that I don't have, and I apologize if I missed it, but you're saying it's approximately three hundred thousand acres. 
um, a buffalo um, habitat down there. Is that correct? Yes. Is that mostly private? Excuse me, mostly uh, public or mostly public BLM property? Yes. Okay. Um, and then the and it came up today. Ben mentioned that there's been an increase in tags uh, due to habitat conditions. What are you expecting the herd to be at at the end of the year? Um, uh, if if I may, I'll back up a little bit. We we actually. Uh, added permits two years ago. Uh, the objective is 325 and has been 325 adults postseason. And we added permits a couple of years ago and brought the population down to 290 because of this ex extended drought conditions that we've had. And uh, more recently with this past year, um, you know, there's some areas that are in pretty tough shape down there. And we had some rains, some recent rains, but it, they were very localized. And so there were areas where, that looked pretty good uh, at this time, but there were some that still looked pretty tough, some important areas. Um, and since then we've had even more rain, so it, it, not sure how overall it looks, but we just felt it was necessary based on what we were seeing at the time to bring the herd down a, a little bit lower. Um, and so the permits that we recommended will bring them down to 275 adults postseason. So we're 50 uh, adults under our objective yeah. at this time. Okay. Yeah, and I remember a year or two ago when that increase um, for the habitat down there and completely get that. And I know this was one of the touchy subjects. Um, it had to be in the committee a meeting. So bring down the bison numbers. Are the grazing numbers coming down as well? From what I from what I understand, yes, that they've taken some voluntary cuts, um, and I don't know specifically how much they've taken, but my understanding is is they have reduced their numbers, the okay. cattle numbers on the range. All right, and then the only other thing I had, um, and I really appreciated you going into detail on the habitat work that's been done and whatnot up to this point. Um, I would, and this is an observation on my part, and. Lots of people call me dumb, so it's okay if you do as well. But is end up being a total, including the fire, of 82,000 acres out of that 300,000 that has had some type of disturbance in the last 60 plus years. Yes. That's okay. not a lot. <laughs> and so I know in your presentation, you said you had a lot of habitat projects lined up or hopefully to get approved, I'm assuming, through the WRI process. Can you give a recap of what you have there? Because six year we disturbance isn't a lot. Um, and and to address your, your point about the, the proportion of projects that we've had, uh, the 3,000 acres is a large boundary area that we basically drew around the mountain. So, uh, but it is all considered habitat, or at least of that portion. Um, and relatively speaking, the Henrys have had a lot of work done, a lot of habitat work done, in addition to the uh, uh, the fire, the 2003 fire. So, so really compared to a lot of other units within the region, and I, I can't speak for the rest of the state, but for within our region, there have has been a lot of work and a lot of habitat projects completed there. Uh, we've, and it's been over a long period of time. Um, specifically about the current projects, I'd probably have to ask Wade. It, it, it just in that. general is fine. It just I, I'm I'm just looking to see, and I'm assuming other people are looking to see because habitat is the issue down there, yeah. especially with this drought. And an important part of that is is the water issues, the water developments, and I know there's been some some work done with uh, trying to get uh, a watering system in some areas that we'd like to see more encourage more bison use. Uh, and I'll, and I'll have what, if I can, I'll have Wade address okay, that. You can talk more specifically. Yeah, there, right now there's uh, there's one project in particular we're looking at. It's on, on Indian Springs benches, which is on the south side of, uh, of Hillers. Um, uh, there's three benches there that are pretty good size. Um, it's been funded uh, where BLM is having some issues with uh, uh, some opposition um, from um, those who don't want to uh, reduce the pinion juniper. And so as soon as that gets remedied, um, that's going to open up some more 
habitat work. Uh, but there's been ongoing reseedings in that um, uh, in uh, some of these older chainings. And um, if, we, if, if we could depend on the moisture, we would probably be doing a lot more right now. Um, as far as reseedings goes. Uh, the BLM is looking uh, to do um, uh, more fires down there and, and uh, open up some more areas. But um, in general, that's what's what's happening. Okay. And just curiosity to say, and off the top of your head is perfectly fine. How much acreage are you looking at in the next few years to actually work on? Um, I do not know what that is. I, I'll, I'll get that for you, though. Um, I don't know what the size of, off the top of my head, I can't remember how big the, that that is, but um, um, I know it will open up approximately, as far as grazing goes, be enough for 50 more, about 50 more cattle on that as well. So, um, uh, and then, of course, it'll be good habitat for deer if we can uh, remove some of that pin and juniper. So, okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. You bet. Just real quick, want to welcome Ryan Brown that just got here. We understand he was out actually helping on a division project, and we're let you know that he's here and representing the uh, sportsman, correct? Public. Oh, you are public at large. I'm sorry. That's right. Okay. Do we have any other questions from the? I, I have the a rest? question. Yes, Jamie. Um, why are elk eliminated from the habitat but not mule deer? Why are elk removed? Is that what you yeah. said? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, at this time, we we don't have a management plan for elk on that unit. Uh, we, it's not an elk unit. In fact, probably those elk have moved there from an adjacent unit somewhere. Uh, and so we're not managing for the elk. Uh, we're actually trying to remove the elk from, from that mountain range. Uh, and we do manage the, the deer population there. So do deer not compete as much with the bison? No, no, they, there's differences in their diet and their, uh, the diet between uh, bison are more in direct competition with livestock, with cattle uh, and deer are browsers, which, you know, they utilize a lot of different uh, browse species. They will utilize some grass species at certain times of the year, as well as uh, forb species. They, they like to, uh, when they're available, they seek out some of those species as well. So their, uh, their diet is quite a bit different than a bison's diet. Okay. Um, and the other question I have, are there wild horses on this unit? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, no, we, we don't have any wild horse issues there. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions from the rack, I'll... Any, we'll go ahead and, are there any questions from the members of the public that are here concerning this agenda item? All right, if not, I'll turn some time over to Ben to do the public survey feedback. Thanks. We did not receive any public comments on this item. Uh, that's it. All right, uh, with no public comments, we have or we do have a comment card here. Um, we have one again from Kevin Norman representing SFW. Um, uh, turn this time to him. Kevin Norman representing SFW. Um, we support the division's recommendations on this. Troy did sit on the committee. Uh, he expressed that there was a lot of give and take from um, all sides on this. Um, it was a long drawn out process, but this, uh, bison herd is very important, not only to our state, but the country. So we definitely want to protect those bison and uh, we support the, the new management plan. Thank you. Okay. Was there anyone else that wanted to comment that didn't have a chance to bring a card up? Okay. If not, um, now turn time over for discussion and comments from the rack.
we if we don't have any i'll just i'll just say i'll, I'll echo it i i like where the the plan came through um this is a significant herd for a lot of different reasons um you sit through those committees and this has been a hot button herd animals for many years in the state of utah and so uh for everyone to come to the table and uh, be able to to come away with a uh, good workable management plan that carries us forward in the future and happy to see that so yes i heard earlier today of a pretty happy individual who received a phone call also that they had drawn one of these extra permits and so it gives sportsmen an opportunity so i think that's nice um we don't have any more comments i'd also entertain a, a motion on this agenda item Make a motion we accept the bison management plan as presented. A motion by Brad to accept the plan as presented. I have a second. I'll second it. And I have a second from Randy. Is there any discussion on the motion? All right, this time I'll, I'll call for a vote. Jamie, we'll begin with you again. I agree. Brian. In favor. Brad. Yes. Yes. Kevin? Yes. Randy? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Nikki? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to our seventh item on the agenda, the LOA rule and amendments uh, and LOA proposals. Um, as we get ready to start this, I had some questions today about exactly what was going to take place with this. As many of you know, there, this was on the agenda just in June. We've had our meetings about this. It went to the Wildlife Board. Um, it passed unanimously, but there was a ca caveat that they invited, uh, invited all shareholders, meaning the LOA associations, the LOA committee that was put together, and also the Division of Wildlife to meet together. And if they had some amendments or changes that they could bring them forward. Um, what we'll be voting on today, what we saw were on this, is on this proposal. The question I had is many, you know, we received a letter and there's some more things that are, that uh, the LOA partners are, are requesting and I'm not exactly sure how, how to do that. So I've asked maybe if that's something that this is, time for them to do that or if we're only here to vote on these that that were agreed on by all parties and so i'd ask chad to maybe address that for a second yeah <clears throat> thank you mr chairman um i think mike's bringing up my slide so this was part of my presentation um when i when i recorded that presentation and went out um yeah, there it is so yeah this this is a little bit different territory where this art just went through um so maybe maybe a little bit of unprecedented here that that there was an opportunity given to LOAs to, to uh, make some recommendations. Um, at that wildlife board meeting, so that was on June 2nd, uh, they, the wildlife board did allow the LOAs to organize and come back and, and present r any changes that they recommended come before uh, that committee. Um, they also said that if, for any of those changes to be brought back, it needed to be agreed upon by that landowner permit committee and the Division of Wildlife. Um, through that process, there were there were four things that were agreed upon, and those things were presented. Um, if you go back and listen to that motion, the intent was anything that was not agreed upon would not come back through the rack and the board process. Um, Throughout this this process, we we struggled as we because we we knew that there would probably be some other proposals coming back through. So we we even struggled internally if we even mentioned them. But but knowing that there'd probably be some proposals coming through, we decided to put that in the presentation. Um, it's it's of our opinion that that it, this is a pretty clear directive from the board that that would just be the, the things to be heard would be the things that that were agreed upon um, and not other things. With that being said, this is a an advisory committee, and you you can advise the board in, in whichever direction you decide. Um, 
what I, what I will say as well is that um, this rule had a committee from the beginning and that the, the, the topic that will probably be brought up and I think it will be brought up tonight is, is on multipliers. Um, there was a committee that was formed. We discussed multipliers at that committee. So it was vetted then. It then went through the rack and board process and it came up in that process and it, it was decided through the wildlife board to not adopt that. And then it came back to the committee on July 28th once again and was discussed at length at that committee and was not supported by, by the committee or the Division of Wildlife. Um, with that being said as well, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the, the multiplier um, if, if you wish. Um, I personally don't feel like it's necessary that we have a, a long discussion on it and focus on the things that we did agree upon. I would just love to know if you could just explain like what the multiplier is. I don't really understand it. Yeah, so so what passed in June was uh, for for every, it was a acreage based. So whatever percentage of the the land that they had in habitat is the amount of permits they would get. The multiplier they're asking for for one and a half times that. So what their their land would uh, yeah count for one and a half times, which would give them some additional permits. Thank you. What question? Yeah, any, open to questions at this time. Yes. It just. I, I want to make certain that I understand it correctly. So after the board passed what they did in June, the guidelines given out at that point were get together with the original committee and, and the LOA members that wanted to be involved in that and come together on things that can be agreed on. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So only the things that were agreed on were going to go through and be presented to the board. Yeah, that's what the motion was. Okay, and I'll just make a comment on this. If we open this up, I'm gonna take out all the things that are agreed to. Any other questions? I have a question. Nikki. Um, were there representatives from the LOA Association? I realize that's part of the acronym. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the LOA group um, on the committee so did they have a voice in the original process? Yes, we had we had uh, two members that were with LOAs and actually a third that had land in an LOA. Okay, and then my second question is, so yes, we received a couple of emails about this. Um, one was from a LOA representative and then the other was from the division saying that the, the data that was up for debate was misinterpreted um, so I'm wondering if you can maybe clarify that a little bit for us. Yeah, so it was it was probably a little bit rushed getting it to the LOAs, but but essentially um, we had one unit where we actually had the LOA shape files and we had callers on it on the Ponsagant unit. So we had one unit. I don't I don't think that was part of your packet, but we did have that one unit that actually did show usage on the LOA grounds, but on all the other ones, it was, we didn't have those shape files. So essentially what that data was is public use of how much they use the public ground. Um, in the Ponsagant one, if you could see what that, that usage was, uh, when, you, when you broke out the LOA ground on it, it went from, uh, if I remember right, it was 58% on public land um, so you'd say, okay, that's 42% that's on, on the private. Well, a majority of that was on the CWMU down there. And the LOA had, uh, I think the year round was like five and a half ish or something like that. So, so, so it was probably a little bit premature to look at that data, um, and point that out when you have other lands like CWMUs that if we take those out that, that really have higher use. Um, it can drastically drop those those numbers of what the LOA is using. So, yeah, that's that's mostly. All right. 
And I guess the, the reason for my comment, and I guess it was what my question was, um, sitting through the wildlife board and as I was present for that and when this motion was made, my understanding was that any proposals, anything that was going to be brought would be brought before that committee and it wasn't the purpose of the RAC to have those new proposals brought to us or it was supposed to have gone through through that committee and not for discussion to reopen that. And so either way, you know, we're here to, to listen, but that, that's why I had the question is, is that we were here to vote on the items that they agreed to and it wasn't a time to have new recommendations from and out any of the individual groups, you know, on their own. So do we have any other questions from RAT concerning this agenda item? I only have a couple of like housekeeping things. When I went through the red line, I um, noticed that there were there were differences in like sometimes it says private landowner and other times it just says landowner, and I assume those kind of mean the same things. But maybe you could work on that, or I don't know. You can comment on that. Yeah, I, I would say that those are landowner and private landowner. <laughs> probably the, the same thing. Um, we can go back and look and try to make that language consistent. I'm impressed you went through that red line. That's, that's a lot of red. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Well it, it's, it's part of my dysfunction. I'm like, it, yeah. The whole room was thinking that. <laughs> uh, nerd here. Yeah. I wasn't going to use that term, but... <laughs> Have you created a spreadsheet with all this as well? <laughs> no, but I have other spreadsheets. I won't even talk about my spreadsheet habits. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions before I turn time over to the public? Do we have any questions from members of the public at this time? Okay, seeing none, we'll now uh, turn some time over to Ben to give an update on the... Uh, same as the last Sorry. item, Sorry. We, we did not have any public input on this item. Okay, thank you. I have two comment cards here. Um, I'll start with, from the public, I'll start with Kevin Norman, ask him to come forward first. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin Norman representing Sportsman's for Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we still support the division's recommendations on this uh, landowner association program. Thank you. Okay, I failed to mention, I, I have a question. Is, I believe it is five minutes for someone representing a group, right? And three for public. I just wanted to make sure I did that right. So we have a uh, comment card here from Dale Christiansen, who's representing the Pilot Mountain LOA and Unlimited LOA, we'll let him introduce himself. Sure. You have five minutes. Hi, I'm Dale Christiansen, and I'm the owner operator of the Pilot Mountain LOA, which is the only LOA in the northern region. Um, and then um, also representing the LOAs, and you know, we have uh, based on the you know the the time that the board did afford us, we have organized ourselves, we've had um, 10 plus meetings together and we're in the form, you know, trying to form a, an association um, as well. Um, I did want to thank you again for the time and you know, thank the division, you know, for giving us the opportunity to come back and we've, um, we did make progress, we believe, and we, we support the changes that are being proposed um, in the rule um, and, you know, want to, say that and suggest it we however we do want to you know take our opportunity to um you know comment on uh the process and that you know there are we believe additional rule changes that um, are key to the survival of of loas um one of the things i wanted to do is just maybe spend a little time for you guys of you're not as familiar with the LOAs because there's only one in the area. And to really understand what the program is, um, 
you know, the LOAs uh, that are enrolled in the program in the state represent over 650,000 acres of private land. Um, those LOAs uh, range in size from as small as 2,000 acres uh, to as large as 87,000 acres. So there's a wide variety of landowners that are involved. Um, there are 21 LOAs in the state and that's with 17 different operators. So there's four LOAs that have multiple species. Um, within those LOAs, there are 743 owners. So I hope you can appreciate the difficulty and of trying to bring forward 743 opinions. <laughs> so, you know, we've worked very hard to boil down and come to the consensus of the things that were important. And, you know, there were a lot of things that we just said, we'll, you know, we have to swallow and, and move forward with. And so I hope you can appreciate that again, we're at the table trying to work with the state. Um, the LOAs uh, are in 2022 were awarded approximately 200 buck and bull permits. Um, you know, we've, I know a lot has been said about the, uh, the collar data and whether it's right or wrong or, um, you know, we were given that data on, you know, Friday and said, here it is. You know, we did our best to analyze it. We did take out the non-LOA land in our calculations. Is it perfect? No, but we believe that it's not far off. A couple of things I want to leave you with. Um, LOAs receive 75% less private tags than CWMUs on a per acre enrolled basis. So it's apples to apples. And I know, you know, the division will get up here and say, well, that's because you can hunt the whole unit. Well, the value of our tags aren't twice what the CWMUs are. And so, again, we believe we're being undercompensated on a per acre basis for what we provide to the state. The LOAs also provide 50% more public access on a per acre enrolled basis. So both of those things, we're providing the state, you know, and again, we think we're doing our part, but it's, it's, it's a linchpin. The other thing is, as many of you know, the largest LOA in the state has decided to, to leave the program. Um, and that's, you know, I don't think, again, you guys should take it lightly. This program was designed to entice and bring landowners in. I know from having talked with all the operators, some of them are holding on by a thread of keeping the landowners involved. And I would just express to you guys the desire that, you know, we're here wanting to work with the state, but there's some further changes that need to be made and would ask you to support that. And, you know, when we come back, thank you. Thank you very much, Dale, and uh, thank you for you hit that timing perfectly. Thank you. Um, all right, we have no other comment cards. Um, so at this time, I'll open up the time for, for comments here for, to the rack and just take a second to maybe give some of my comments on this. I, I mentioned them already that um, wasn't positive. This is the time to have those things rep presented here. Obviously, it's time to come up and to share them, but or anyone's welcome to share their thoughts, you know, during during this time. And I, it was a bit confusing to me knowing if this was a, that we would have an opportunity to have these things presented to us again. But um, I like in the original presentation that was done three months ago when they said that, you know, when we talked about the different programs to try to afford and help um, landowners, you know, it's not a one size fit all. There's so many different programs and we hope that uh, 
we can find the right one for each situation and it, and it, it can be difficult. But it, it's so hard to compare them to the CWMU program when you involve public land and you're affecting the permits, the CWMU, when they're issued permits, they don't come from a, a public allotment. And that is a, a, a really a big difference because um, by d using this multiplier and by giving more permits out, we are essentially taking away some public opportunity there. And I, I think it's important when we do that, I think it's important that the LOAs and the state come together where it's a, a give and take and that it's equal. There's not more taking than, than giving. And I, I feel like what was brought to, for the wildlife board and what's brought to us has really, is it perfect for everyone? It's probably not, but it is, it is close on the give and take being equal on, on both sides. Having the opportunity to hunt, not just your private lands, but outside is huge. If you're on a CWMU unit and you're hunting an animal and it crosses a fence, you're done. You know, it's no longer there where in LOA you're able to hunt the unit. So um, the other thing is, is this plan will come forward again and there'll be more opportunities to try to try to work. But I feel at this time to get this thing done, we, we've gone through this at length for three or four months now and I'm happy with where where we are at right now. And those are my thoughts. <laughs> Brad's like, just do it. <laughs> I can see it. Um, I'm incredibly sensitive to the plight of the LOAs. I'm not trying to minimize that, but I sort of agree with you, Justin. And I'm wondering if maybe there's some direction for us as to what the next steps are. I don't know if we're in a position to make a recommendation that goes back to the board, it sounds to me like the board already gave a pretty clear directive that the LOAs would have an opportunity to meet and then go back to the board, not necessarily to us. So I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page about kind of what the next steps might actually be before we go down a rabbit hole of lengthy discussions, which could happen, I think. I'll take a stab at that real quick. So we're here today to vote on the proposal that was brought to us before the divisions. If we were to vote to accept it as presented, we would be agreeing with the four tenants, I don't know the word, or four amendments that, that all parties agreed to. And so that is what's being brought before us. If we choose and want to approve those four things and an additional motion that the division were to, or the wildlife board were to, to look at those thoughts, or if we agree, if you agree with what the, Landowner Association is brought before us, we could add that into a motion. Ultimately, all we're doing is, you know, giving counsel or advice to the, to the wildlife board. Ultimately, they'll have the final say and the LOAs will have the opportunity to share these same things there as well. And ultimately it'll be the wildlife board that gets to make that decision. And um, so, does that answer your question at all of what we'll be voting for or, or maybe? Yeah, not? no, it does. Thank you. I guess maybe my other concern is I don't feel personally like I'm adequately educated enough to make a motion with an amendment because I'm not exactly sure that I understand all the caveats of what the, the disagreement or the sort of, yeah, disagreement, we'll just use that word, is. Um, and so it makes me a little bit nervous for us or for me anyway, as a member of the RAC to to make a further sort of adjustment to the amendment other than how it's already written. Um, I guess I disagree with that a little bit. I mean, it was pretty clear in my reading of this that our mandate is to up or down vote on the things that they agreed on because that was, that was the motion that the board made, the stipulation the board made was that all parties had to agree in order for the wildlife board to revisit this. You know, if each individual rack is going to just kind of throw their two cents in and get eight or nine different proposals back to the board, that doesn't help anybody. Um, the agreement was we can revisit this. We will propose the things that everybody agreed on and then we'll vote on those. And for the record, I, I feel that way as well. I just, as a chair, if there was a member here that wanted to make a motion, I guess I would 
let their let their voice be heard and it would but I, I agree with what Matt's interpretation of that was as well. But I I would agree with that. This is a little bit of a unique situation to have this come back through after, but um, what I took was the board was clear enough in their directive of kind of specifically what, what we were going to be looking at when it came back through. So I do, uh, I support the four amendments that came back through after going through the committee. I still think it's, it puts the program in the right spot as a whole. So, um, you know, with those those agree those amendments or whatever we want to call them, changes that were agreed upon with the committee and the division, I think um, were acceptable. Randy, so I just chime in real quick. One, I think Chad's a saint. Um, the other thing I was going to throw in, I I agree. I think that's what we're supposed to be doing here. The rules laid out. That's why I commented earlier. If we're going to open it up that things would get very messy and very ugly. Um, so I think that's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, I am gonna throw out there um, that I think this is the least palatable program we have in the state. I struggle mightily with this program. Um, I am glad that one of the four things that was added was to try to set up some performance metrics. There's, there's up to this point, there hasn't been anything. Um, so I, I'll, I'll be happier once I see those, um, but I, I struggle with this program. Any other comments? If we have none, I'd entertain a motion. Um, I would make a motion that we accept the um, proposal I was presented. So we have a motion by Matt Clark to accept the, the rule as amendment as proposed and a second by Kevin McLeod. Any discussion on, on the motion? Seeing none, I'll, I'll call for a vote. We'll start with Jamie. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Brad. Yes. Matt. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Randy. No. Paul. Abstaining. Abstaining. And yes. All right. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six yeses, one abstention, and one vote against um, this time. So the motion passes. This time I'll give an opportunity for Randy to share his reason for his vote. Against. I'm just being consistent. I and mean, when this matter came up before, I voted against it because we had no performance matrix at all um, for this program, and I I can't ex can't support it until there's there's more accountability in the program. Okay, and abstention. Oh, please. Um, as an individual, I certainly support where we're headed with this. Um, I. Appreciate where the wildlife board sent this back with these stipulations and how the um, DWRs worked with the LOA to get to this point. But um, we, as the Forest Service, we don't want to be implementing or really affecting how um, things are affected on private land. So we're just, I'm going to say anything. Okay, thank you. With that, um, there are no other presentations for our. Our region. So at this time, I uh, will call will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance and participation. <laughs>